So uh, we are happy to have an open discussion, talk with you about what we've been doing for about a year and get your ideas. This is a very, very big, broad space of AI co-design. We've met with lots of people on the software side, on the network side, uh, from industry, um, and then we've been bringing our limited uh, background and expertise to this topic, so very happy. So what I might recommend is please come forward so we can have a conversation because we're not doing any presenting, so hanging out in the back row is just kind of, <laughs> I don't know, um, feel, feel free, I guess. Yeah, and then uh, I would be happy to introduce uh, some of the working group colleagues. I can't really see because of light. So I see Matt Bergeron, Keysight. See Winston Liu, Keysight. We have um, Matt Short from Omdia. He's kind of around. Uh, who else has been participating with us? Robert Fang from Portwell. Portwell has been with us. There's Matt. So yeah. Um, we're kind of starting from what we've presented this morning in our keynote. That's the discussion point. So what's on your mind? What, what discussion would you all like to have? We can have a short session. <laughs> oh, we can't turn oh, these around. Can I borrow the mic? Oh, so, I tried to, in, in, sorry, whoa, the projector's killing me. Um, <laughs> I tried to suggest some collaboration areas, and some of them were controversial, and we could argue, we should argue um, what the priorities might be. Um, OCP is generally a, a hardware center community, so when I jumped into this group, the first request I got from everyone is, let's standardize system buses. And by system buses, they didn't mean CXL. It really meant, let's get rid of NVLink um, without saying those words. And I hinted at that in, in my talk, but I didn't put it in writing. Um, and I think that's a good thing, but that's also a very hardware-centric view. And that's, it's hard, but, but doable and easy. I think the, the modeling and the software side of this is a whole lot harder. Um, the question is, is OCP the right place to do that or not? Are we, are we so from a work stream point of view, what we should focus on in this group, should we go after the software side, the modeling side, um, the code, is, is that what's most important or should we fall back to our, what's, what's easy, which is work on system buses, physical interfaces? How would you guys prioritize that? It's a question of, I, in, my, in my view, it's do we want to win in two years or do we want to win in, in five years? It's, it's what sort of, or do we, we work on both? And it's gonna affect how we prioritize what we do next year, the people we recruit into the group, um, interactions. What, what would be success for us this afternoon? Again, we kind of, the place that FTI, Future Technologies Initiative, takes in the OCP work stream is stuff that the industry has agreed is valuable to collaborate on, doesn't have a working, any work done on it today, uh, any unified or coherent work, and that's three to five years out. So if we draw the lower end of that, this is year one, just getting our arms around the space. What are the hardware components, systems, subsystems, um, architectures, what are the logic functions, what are the calls, what are the databases, what are the things that actually drive the design of hardware, and, and what are the opportunities for collaboration? So we have been meeting about bi-weekly every three weeks for about a year, just trying to wrap our arms around that space, bringing in a lot of guest speakers. Um, now what would be success for us is where do we point this group? Who should be joining us in year two? So we kind of want to be able to present that to the OCP board so they can bring it to the incubation committee and start to ha engage the industry for us and say, hey, uh, here, are, here are the things we need as a community to be building towards any type of community progress on this massive, uh, shrouded in, in proprietary nature um, uh, aspects of AI workloads and all that. So is anything that was presented this morning interesting, want to have a conversation about? Would you like us to talk a little more about some other areas that we identified for collaboration? 
Yes on both. The second one, okay. Um, is everyone here familiar with Glow, the compiler for ML stuff? Um, okay, so G-L-O-W, uh, just doing a search on it. Um, it. It's an open source tool from Facebook, now Meta, uh, which is meant to be a third party compiler essentially for ML workloads with some level of abstraction of hardware performance? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to think of it more as a compiler than an abstraction. I mean, I guess a compiler does provide an abstraction. It general. gives you some level of selection of what, sure. yeah, what hardware yeah. you've been running on. Um, so, so one of the thoughts we had was around building communities of Glow. Again, part of the role of FTI is we can be reaching out into academia, startups, national labs, other folks that might be interested. So um, another example of a collaboration area was theoretical limits for cash? No, performance? What was that one? Hey, I'm going to look it up right now. I mean, I mean, this probably ties back to what we were saying about modeling. I mean, right now, people build these systems, and we measure them as a whole, and then we see what the problems are. We don't really take the time to look at them theoretically. In order to do that, you sort of need models. Like, if you have a memory, OK, you need to know the access profiles, what the bandwidth looks like, what the latency looks like. If you knew that, you could calculate analytically, theoretically, what sort of performance you should get. And maybe theoretical isn't the right way to go about it. Maybe a empirical simulation approach might be better. But it's also not clear that that's something that people are currently looking at versus, I mean, people look at it. It's like, OK, my bus speed is this. The data sheet says this. Um, but that doesn't necessarily theoretically tell you how it'll perform in the system. Yeah, and so building up both sides of those, both some level of relevance of workload that we can agree upon that's like benchmark essentially, and then also what are those hardware inputs? How do we, I remember part of the discussion that we've been driving is what are the right layers at which we can compartmentalize? Is it at the cluster level? Is it at the node level? Um, is it at the architecture level? That was that whole... Um, right, and I think if we, if we do that, um, we can almost set... I guess I'll call them compliance points or, or you know, delineation. Like when we presented system diagrams, it's very logical. We didn't draw any boundaries. We can propose some boundaries. And then within a boundary, we can specify the operations around it. And that within that boundary, that can be optimized. It's sort of like a Lego or a brick. Um, and you could argue what that is in OCP. It's either a component. It's a, you know, a multiple rack unit. It could be an entire rack, and you could argue how big each one of those things should be. Um, but the key is defining the standards and then getting interoperability. Because no point defining the standards if it's all going to be from NVIDIA. Well, maybe there is a point. But it would be nice if you define the standards. You could have an AMD box, an NVIDIA box, an Intel box, you know, startup XYZ all operating in harmony. Yeah, is it a shelf, is it a server, is it combined? Like, where can we abstract that and design to and then model and simulate with some of these tools? Um, sending academia, one of the other options was sending academia off to kind of evaluate the memcache uh, kind of theoretical limit by using math and seeing if we can understand that. Again, some of that performance boundary stuff will drive back to our use cases and understanding what are our theoretical limits that we're dealing with in some of the hardware. Um, since you men <coughs> mentioned academia, Alan, one thing I would like to see, you look in networking, I'm a networking guy, a lot of work in academia around simulations, NS3, which evolved from NS1, NS2, there's a few other simulators, it all came from academia, industry is adopting it to some level, and there's companies built around it. We don't have a lot of that in storage and I.O., and maybe that research is happening, maybe I'm just not aware of it, you know, being in networking too long, but I used to work in storage, I didn't see a lot of that either. Mm -hmm. I think that would be a great area for university collaboration. Mm -hmm. Open sourceable workloads, maybe getting OCP to define some level of high precision uh, network layers, whether F16 or whatever they are that we can begin to standardize around, um, might start to be an enabler of AI co-design and collaboration. That's where we got to in about a year. <laughs> this is actually something that um, almost came up at lunch, although I was thinking about it in the back of my head, is um, 
you know, when I went over that system diagram, there's a front end network and the back end network. And I said in the front end network, it's things like TCP, the back end tends to be more specialized. And I said, well, okay, people are doing RDMA, some people using Finite Band. There's also like a plethora of innovation of new protocols at that transport layer. And some of them are in the opening, some of them are in research, some of them are, are um, I guess, behind NDAs and closed doors at uh, vendors and at hyperscalers. Um, I could be biased because I'm a networking guy, but I think that's a good area for collaboration, specifically applied to the domain of exchanging data in machine learning apps. I'm not sure if that is should be into the realm of OCP. Um, you know, that's typically like IETF territory, but I don't, my gut is telling me that we won't get it in IETF. Yeah. And, and some of this, for those of you that have been around OCP for a while, this is an evolution for us on expanding into that software realm, right? We started doing it with uh, OS uh, for the network layers with things like Sonic. Um, now we're having to reckon with the idea that any hardware we're designing for this customization and optimization at this scale and for these workloads requires some level of software integration, knowledge, uh, and bringing that into this community. And it might even go further than that. We'll see how this goes. But I mean, I think at some point, especially in this AI co-design space, we might see software first. I know OCP is a hardware first, hardware focused organization, but we might find that doesn't work for this particular work group. I mean, one, one thing that, that resonated with me with all the talks today is, is how much software content there was or need for software mm -hmm. and some of the gaps that we have. Okay, so we're done talking. What, what's on your mind? Alan, do you want to do intros? Do you want to have people here? Yeah, we'd we love to do that. People, where they sit in the, in that, the chain. That's a wonderful idea. So I'll start. Alan Smith, um, my day job is, is leading hardware research for Meta, formerly Facebook, mainly on the infrastructure stack, but we do touch some of the consumer goods and the, the connectivity hardware. So running all the lab environments, you know, designing, um, designing uh, in-house innovation in partnership with some of our ODM manufacturer and, and, and open source work streams. Uh, the, the job that I'm here under is as a volunteer leader for OCPFTI, so I'm the chair for Future Technologies Initiative. Within Future Technologies Initiative, uh, we do these symposium events, which are more call for paper things, and then we also get directed by the board to take on certain work streams. So those are those three keynotes that we got. Matt. Hi, I'm, I'm Matt Bergeron. I'm uh, the networking CTO at, at Keysight. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, I run a, a, a few things. I run a product strategy group and a labs group. Um, we, we engage you know, tightly with customers and in, in standards bodies, open, open communities like OCP, and innovate. Um, I resonated with, well with uh, the speaker from Samsung this morning, trying to innovate in a large company. Uh, we do that. I like to think that I'm more successful than you know the sad stories from Samsung, but maybe not. <laughs> I'll go next. <clears throat> Matt Short, and I work for Informa, and I'm the director of consulting and look. Oh, what? Move over this way. In out of the light, out of the light. You have to be blinded. Yeah, right in the wow here. A video. Oh, okay, okay. No problem. Massive. I will try not to hide. Um, so yeah, I, I read, lead the consulting organization and look at everything from enterprise workloads to semiconductors to cloud and data center to security and AI and IoT. So spent a long time, a couple years doing that and then prior to that worked uh, more on the networking side. So building networking processors for Freescale and XP that did security and all sorts of things. And I guess what we're interested in is, yeah, looking at what are the use cases, Looking at how these systems are going to be built, who the vendors are, um, you know, and what what are the overall architectures over time, and then what does it take to to help accelerate that or or change it a little bit? So, get everybody talking the same language. Who wants to go next? Come on up. Hi, um, Winston Liu. So I I work for Keysight. Um, my day job is pretty much doing um, software, driving some of our uh, lab projects. So recently, I've been actually working on some stuff about um, how to make like sort of 
networking system type of experiments easier. So working on fabric emulators and things like that. Right? So my part of the <laughs> sort of um, thing that I bring to this group is um, trying to figure out like you know how to make this whole data flow stuff that we do in the networking realm to apply it to the bigger system, right? That may cross not just like InfiniBand or Ethernet, but also over like I/O buses and things like that. Uh, so my name's uh, Doug Ace. Oh. Yeah. Over more. <laughs> my name's Doug Acey. I'm a mechanical engineer with Equinix, and uh, uh, we're a co-location service provider. So um, I've been pulled into quite a few um, customer deals recently, where we're dealing with uh, cooling for some some large AI deployments. So I, I'm really kind of here to just kind of learn. I, I don't know if that's really what you guys are... That, that was one of the things that we did was try to define whether cooling was because we're getting into these densities of 600, yeah, 800 yeah. watt GPUs. Yeah, we're, we're having to pull in liquid cooling now and you know, right air cooling just doesn't work anymore. So, yeah. so um, you know, I'm, I'm just kind of here to see... I'm not real familiar with OCP, but um, excellent. wanting to see, see and learn what what you guys are where you're at? <laughs> Thank you for joining us. We have we have a lot of talks uh, l later in the summit about some uh, air assisted liquid cooling. There's definitely some immersive technologies that are coming mm -hmm. out there. Okay, so, yeah. glad so. to be here. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I'll just throw that out as another collaboration area. I mean, power is. I don't have the data in front of me. I've seen it from analysts, and they say training a model is equivalent to the carbon foot footprint of a plane, you know, circling the Earth or something, right? Um, I think power could be something this group looks at. Um, doesn't mean it's top our priority, but it's it's an option. So yet another key site guy. I'm Scott Westlake. Uh, I just got a new job a week ago. Traditionally, I've been working in technology partnerships, business development, investment uh, stuff. Now I'm looking at long term. So uh, uh, long-term uh, tech trends and external innovation um, involves identifying some of these research institutions and, and consortia and potentially investing in, in uh, time and resources to support those. Would you like to introduce yourself? Oh. We're, we're all just introducing ourselves. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't expect. Uh, I also need to introduce myself. So I'm a firm engineer. So I pre previously worked on the SSD controller. So I, and I just changed a job to software company working on the call side, uh, customized uh, SOC. So I'm here to just to learn uh, how can my daily work contribute to the trend of the technology. And I feel excited. I am actually contributing a little bit, and I feel connected. How uh, is my daily work? This is kind of like exciting to me, so that's why I'm here. Thank you for all your like knowledge and the sharing. Thank you so much. I just went. Anyone one, one else? <laughs> yeah, okay. Just okay. I'm. I'm they want to be able to see you on the camera. So okay, no problem. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jalil. I'm founder of Cohen, a power electronics startup company uh, based in Turkey. And I think we are the only member of OCP in Turkey. Uh, so this is my first summit also. Uh, so we are designing a OCP V3 power supply. Uh, this is our first objective. But on the other hand, we are trying to explore ways in to increase OCP compliant hardware usage in Turkey. So that's the another reason that I participate in the uh, in the summit. And the other one was uh, to I mean we are pretty good at hardware so we are trying to explore ways in uh, increasing our uh, hardware software uh, coupling. So uh, between the three topics in the Future Technologies Initiative, this is AI, hardware, and software topic is really interesting for us because uh, we have some AI startups in Turkey also. Uh, so that's it. Okay, thank you. If you're here, you might as well introduce yourself. Come on up.
Hi, this is Zhang Ping. I'm the platform hardware architect in uh, Apple. So definitely we're doing some of the, you know, um, system solution uh, for uh, the data center, definitely including the AI uh, solution as well. So, so one of the things we're thinking about is also about how the hardware can best match with the AI application needs in terms of the you know, system architecture performance, definitely the cost as well, right? So this is definitely the big pick topic in the, in the, I think in the industry as well. So this is our own, also my interesting. Yeah, thank you. Got two mics. Go ahead and head up. Hi, I'm Divakar. Um, I'm a hardware uh, device dev engineer and uh, architect for uh, um, AI and ML platforms for AWS. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm trying to learn uh, from OCP. This is my first OCP here and uh, looking at uh, future technologies, that's pretty interesting. And I'm trying to relate that to what's happening in AWS and uh, what's happening on the ground. So yeah, let's see how things go, thanks. So you've probably got a great perspective because like me at Meta, I'm so defined by my applications, right? So I'm trying to abstract myself, but that's my only knowledge in this. You've got that generic customer set where you're trying to figure out where the market is for workloads, right? So that's kind of the right perspective for us to be having. So. Thank you so much for being here. Well, I'm going to add to diversity of the crowd in terms of names and accents. So my name is Vladimir Kozlov. I'm founder and CEO of uh, Light Counting Market Research. We've been mostly looking at um, optical networking technologies over the last almost 20 years, seeing how they progressed from DC cables to you know, board to board interconnect. And we've been uh, looking at AI. I'm still learning about AI, but our clients are asking more questions about it because they're starting to use optical connectivity. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I have a feeling we're gonna see a lot more of it in the future as the data rates go up, as the bandwidth seems to be the limit. And optics is very good in solving that issue. And particularly when it comes to reducing power of um, IOs, I think that's where optics could really excel. Yep. Um, so we work closely with um, cloud data center operators, we work with industrial companies, but we also help government organizations. So um, we did a project for RPE three years ago when they started funding next generation optical technologies and we're actually starting to do another project for them now more focused on AR, AI architectures, how they're changing, and what it's gonna potentially mean for the optical connectivity. So Absolutely. I'm learning here from that perspective, so thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think we have one more. Do you mind introducing yourself? Oh, can I bring it to you? Okay. Um, so one of the classic trade-offs we're working with is that kind of memory performance versus latency, like how much density we can get in the storage that's feeding into our algorithms uh, and into our training systems. So the, the optical piece becomes a way to get around that right now for some of our interconnects. So yeah, it's a fascinating space. Hey, Yang, we're introducing ourselves. Hello, my name is Haider Solomon, and I am a solution architect with Broadcom. And I'm here just to learn about the concept, networking requirement, protocols, Sonic, you mentioned Sonic. And everyone talks about a system or, or uh, nodes. I need to understand if this refers to a compute node, server side, or the fabric, the network side. Excellent. Yang, come on up. We have a stream going, so you have to get into the light. Did, did you get? Yeah, you did get to introduce. So this is our last uh, key member here. He's part of the keynote. This is Yang. Hey, nice to meet you. Light. Hi, I'm Yang Seokki, a senior director of Memory Solutions Lab from Samsung. I'm working on various topics, including CXL and uh, AI Accelerator and uh, computational storage. Nice to meet you. Okay, what else is on your mind? Apple gentleman still here? 
Sure. Yeah, yeah. What, what's, what's on your mind, like the size, that the workloads that drive different bandwidth requirements? Like, he, he's having an issue walking, yeah. Yeah. Like the machine learning or the AI fabric, do they run a separate dedicated fabric or they, they are part of a normal data center deployment? Both. Um, you know, people striving for the, the highest performance tend to put it on a separate fabric. Um, I don't think there's any universal truth in this. Some people are still operating it on, on a, a combined fabric. Um, there's, there's that fabric sometimes is, is Ethernet, sometimes it's something else. So all of the above, um, in terms of speeds and feeds and, and bandwidths and things, um, you know, 100 gig is old news, that's what I'll say. I'm, although I'm sure it's widely used in production. Everyone is looking for things faster than that. And, and what, I, what we've observed is, is two separate layers of the network. Um, if you're familiar with the ML, the machine learning training applications, typically at the scale of trying to interconnect those GPUs that are, that are running the, the matrix multiplication, we're finding that there is an interconnect network that's separated from maybe your fabric network that kind of engages with the pop and engages with the users. Are you familiar with that? Uh, so, so typically in AI, we're doing machine learning training. So think of Facebook application. The three billion people that use it, what are their daily activities and what are they gonna be interested in? And the way they make money is which ads, you know, Senator, we sell ads. So which ad advertisements are this, is this person more likely to engage with? So training is taking all those activities, all today's activities, and continuing to retrain and say, what do we think this person is going to engage with? What do we think this person is going to engage with? We come out with an algorithmic output, and then we can infer, again, this is taking that algorithm, taking it back to the three billion people and saying, now, who does this apply to? So that's a different workload than the training piece is. The training piece, because of the scale of transactions and memory that we need to access, correct me if I'm off here, this is my limited understanding being more on the research side, and Yang's much closer to the application, um, is, is when we're trying to run parallelism at that scale, which, you know, at Meta, I'm gonna call it in the thousands of GPUs, I think they'll talk about it a little bit later, it's a shifting target constantly. Uh, and then we use custom silicon as well as GPU-based inference acceleration but they're definitely two separate applications. We leverage our fabric network much more on that inference side than we do on the training side. The training side, for us, the way we've set it up, which is thousands and thousands of GPUs, uh, we have to have an interconnected network once we enter into that training application. Yeah, so the, one of the, the, the case that I observe is that especially, uh, actually it depends on the, uh, your use cases, but uh, the, one of the, the strong trend I observe is that the training side especially, the feeding the data uh, from the storage to the GPU is, is actually gonna be, is bottleneck. So there are several companies actually try to f find solution to feed data from the, the storage to GPU, mm -hmm. but the network and G the storage side itself is actually bottleneck. So they need to special actually the network separate from the common network you are using. So to, for that purpose, for example, if you're using the RDMA, whether it's good enough or not, it is not actually. So you need a little bit different architecture to support that kind of bandwidth. So uh, back to your question, whether we have a separate network, yes, especially training side, uh, there are several bottlenecks that they actually observe. So to support that, uh, I think they have to have a separate network for that. A 400 gig base and the multiple NIC card. And to, as I mentioned earlier, that separate network is probably running something beyond normal TCP. Mm -hmm. I think everyone's doing something a little different. You know, the what's probably most common is some sort of RDMA, you know, whether that's Rocky over Ethernet or whether that's InfiniBand um, or something else. Every company is doing something slightly different. But it is. There's a lot of, I guess, research and, and, and everyone trying to innovate in that area, I'll say, including your company. Um, it's, and I see everyone sort of doing it in a, in a vacuum. I don't see much openness around it. I'm just involved in a lot of, in a lot of customer meetings, but. 
it's the networking side associated with training is is very hard. Um, and a lot of it is just the way the workloads work is, and I'm no ML expert, but from my understanding is, you know, uh, you, you distribute your model across a bunch of GPUs. They each work in parallel, and then they exchange data, they exchange gradients and synchronize. So you go from a, a, a like an empty network to an all-on network with everyone exchanging data with everyone else to an empty network. And so that time in the network when data is being exchanged could be the bottleneck. Now you try to pipeline that and overlap that with the calculations, but as you scale further, it, it's harder because everyone is communicating with everyone. And servers net, at what net cost? Is it 100 gig servers? 100 to 200 is what I've seen. Yeah, I, I mean, current, 100's probably in production, people are working on 200 and 400. You know, there's people working on speeds faster than that. It's a good question. I mean, mo mostly, mostly it's running over Rocky, which is a layer three technology. I, I don't know actually how the, the network is IP'd or anything. That's a good, I've never wanted that detail. I don't know. Yeah, so a, a bunch of stories, pretty new ones. The our rack and the servers connected through the top Tor switch. That's, that's, uh, that's where you can actually feed it. If you have a, uh, go beyond that, it's very hard to feed the GPU. But it, it, there is a good point there. Um, what works reasonably well is when you, when everything goes through one switch, like a one tier network, and that's mostly because at least in the ethernet world, people are still relying on priority flow control for this and a lossless network. Mm -hmm. When the scale goes beyond that, where you can't fit it in you know, the biggest, you know, baddest switch ASIC you can get from Broadcom or someone else, that's when it starts to get hard because you got to build a multi-tiered clone network just like your normal fabric. And, uh, you know, blocking technologies like PFC, they work, but everything stops. Um, so you start to lose some of the, the parallelism and that's where a lot of people are, they're looking at diff different things there that, are, that try to avoid PFC. That was one of the areas of collaboration. It's probably like a year two, year three thing. It's probably not the top priority, but was called out to us, was the idea of debuggers, both on the hardware and software side. Um, when, when we started scaling up our AI workloads, um, Meta was facing, don't quote me on this, I'm just gonna go off the top of my memory, something like 47% uh, loss. They couldn't finish their models about half the time. And that we couldn't identify whether that was a software bug or a hardware bug that was preventing us from completing our workload. So, so even having better tools, but again, we need to have some level of understanding because these are very disparate workloads and they're kind of, they're, they're very different for each company um, as far as what, what workloads we're running. And there really is no reason why these companies should bring those workloads because that's a little bit of the magic sauce that's running these companies, right? The, uh, running their, their competitive advantage. So we kind of have to, Right now, I'm saying I think that we understand that's a constraint, that we need to figure out the right level of abstraction, the right level of interface that we can create communities around and create standards around and, and whatever. Have you identified, well, now that you've done a great job at identifying like who our target is, mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like at a high level, OCP is about getting technology that, you know, Meta can solve the problem because they have the scale, but you know, a ten thousand person company cannot, um, or a, a thousand person. And how do you distribute that down? Here's where I'll challenge it. Right. So research and development today. Uh, I, I came from NASA before I joined IT about five years ago. Um, it's extremely point to point. So at Meta, Facebook, uh, who are the researchers that we know? What are the conferences that we go to? We'll engage with those areas of research. Microsoft is doing the same thing, Amazon's doing the same thing, Apple, Google are doing the same thing. So the idea of these open source communities are that we can move together on big, hairy things that are facing all of us. So yes, I'll give it to you, we, we have 60 billion in the bank at Meta, we can, we can figure it out eventually. I believe we will move faster 
when we can offload a little bit to the industry and say, hey, what are these standards? What are the communities we can build? How can we build better tools? How can we build better modeling and simulation capability? And then we do our very specific workload specific stuff in parallel. Every company is gonna spin their wheels and waste resources doing that themselves. So there's some areas, I believe, very strongly, we've spent a year trying to figure some of this stuff out, where we can move faster together. And I believe this will bring along the vendor side, right, that's trying to figure out uh, computational storage drives and, and, and M.2 accelerators and all that stuff uh, of where they can better service our industry. So probably can't get there alone. I think we can do it more efficiently together. It, if we you know, it, it, it's a genuine question. Is it a push or a pull from an OPCP's perspective? Oh, so are we saying, vendors, here's what we need for alignment to move faster together, or is it, you know, you know, I think here's, it's here's the problems we're trying to push down so that other people who are part of the community can learn from us. Does they see the difference? Yeah, I, th I think that depends on where you sit. I'm only going to speak yeah. as Alan Smith here. No, no, fair enough. So if I work at a certain company or two that has something like 90% of the, of, the, <laughs> of the market when it comes to GPUs, I'm probably pretty happy with where things are at. And I'm just happy that people are going to follow my roadmaps regardless of what my bins are from TSMC and what I need <laughs> to charge and what, what watts I'm going to give you. Um, I would say that for the new entrants and for the adopters, that's the piece in the developer side of this community. Uh, we are, I will speak very openly as Meta, we are thrashing in this. So if you followed our trajectory, uh, trying to scale up and do something like 24 GPUs threaded together, oh, it's actually 80. Oh, you know what, it's over 1,000. In two years, going through that level of system development with silicon shortages, and not even knowing if they're the right applications, not even knowing if we have the right failure rates or if we're addressing the right problems. So we're just dumping resources at this problem. And so much so that now we probably have, let's call it 30, 40% of our arms wrapped around it. And now they're like, can you do five different supercomputing applications at once? Full stack from silicon through, through application. So we don't really know what we're doing, but you need to do about 5X of yeah. <laughs> is where we are as an industry. I don't know, uh, CMAC, you want to talk about what's going on in your neck of the woods there? Where, where is your interest in this community? Where do you think that this community can benefit Google? Everyone meets CMAC, star guest speaker. <laughs> uh, thank you for putting me on spot. <laughs> Been trying to get you to come for a year. Well, um, I think uh, what I'll do is uh, do my job. I'm a I'm a OCP guy, uh, open compute. Um, I've been uh, encouraging people to work together because that's when we can go far. Um, remember, if you want to do it fast, do it alone. If you want to go far, do it together. Um, with the um, accelerators, we established um, a module that was open, OAI, OAM first, and building a module by itself was not sufficient. We realized we needed to build a system around it. So we had the OAI, the Open Accelerator Infrastructure. There is a very active um, uh, sub-team, sub-group working on that as part of the server project. Uh, Whitney Zhao from, from Facebook is leading, and uh, Pankaj from Google, our co-chair of that. And they do have a track on Wednesday. Um, I believe it is shortly after lunch in the afternoon. That's an uh, open uh, uh, invitation to all of you guys to attend. So it's largely built around the GPU interface, The word GPU... Uh, Accelerate. It, just, it, it, is, it is actually built around generic, even heterogeneous uh, set of devices on one large board that we called UBB, upper, uh, the uh, universal building block. So you start with a universal building block that abstracts the uh, accelerator, and it recognizes that these things need to connect to a host of a sort, uh, CPU as a sort. So it is a host interface board. And it also recognizes that um, um, these kind of accelerators sometimes would like to do peer-to-peer -peer outside of the bounds of what a CPU might provide. So there, it does have an expansion interconnect outside, a different pathway that could be proprietary, or it could be Ethernet, or it could be uh, it's just flexible. CXL. Uh, <laughs> CXL. Um, very good, but CXL we first positioned as the host interface, 
And then later, once it grows, it might be a fabric interface at some point. Um, but we do recognize, again, um, we bring uh, the best of all worlds together. Uh, we, we're not going to prescribe everybody should do it one way. For example, there was a question earlier today, uh, should there be a proprietary interconnect for peer devices, CPUs or GPUs or such? Hey, if, if you can do a better job doing it that way, that's fine. But we would like at a system level abstract that when you connect to other elements, the networking elements, storage elements, CPU element, let that layer be standard. And of course, there was another conversation that's saying, oh yeah, we have OpenCAPI, we have C6, we have Gen Z, we have uh, uh, NVLink, we have all those kind of things as methodology to interconnect things, which one should I do? My recommendation to them being a CXL guy is do it the one that everybody else is con contributing. Uh, that's how it will move forward longer. Uh, the collaboration on SOC, CPU suppliers, device suppliers, switch suppliers, networking, and all of those are happening uh, around uh, CXL. We have all of the processor suppliers, um, IBM, Intel, AMD, ARM, all of them are pushing towards CXL as a native interconnect from the CPU. Hey, we haven't had that kind of thing for a long time. So let's take advantage of it. Let's help them be successful, and we will benefit from that. Is there anything, because um, that was a couple of years ago, we started the OAM, OAI stuff. Is there anything now, what, knowing what you know, that you would go back and redesign how we started approaching this problem as an industry? Uh, engaging collaborators earlier. Okay. Uh, Define collaborators. Competitors, uh, anybody who can bring something in in the mix of open open source. Um, I think I've actually identified. If I didn't present it today, I will do it tomorrow. Uh, collaborators are the ones that are bringing something. Is a new feature, new technology, management of running the uh, organization, um, helping out building reference designs. A any of those contributions are necessary for an open open source community. Um, so people get together and everybody says, hey, potluck lunch, this is what I have. What can you do with it? Mm -hmm. uh, th th there was questions today, for example. I have a challenge to you. How do you do this? Well, I haven't thought about it, but mm -hmm. it seems that you have articulated the problem very well. Mm -hmm. Please come and help me at least explain what you want so that maybe we can work together to solve the problem. So that's how. Yeah, and then the other piece uh, that I'm interested in while I've got you is uh, the software side. H how, how much are you feeling like you want to understand that piece as a, uh, as a layer that adds to, like if we, if, we does, if we figure out OAM, OAI, and collaborate as an industry together, that's maybe half of the picture of the optimization that needs to happen between okay. software and software. Uh, very good question, and again, I share with you my journey through OCP. That's the best way I can talk about it. Um, I came to hyperscale business from an enterprise company. It came from HPE. Um, we always built things that we needed to and pushed it through enterprise. Then I joined Microsoft. When I went there, I was introduced to open uh, community OCP. So, ah, that's another world of wonders here. Um, so let's just make contributions. So we made contributions. Um, but we were not very careful about who would benefit from these contributions. We did our own, perhaps other companies did the same, and but we were nice enough to say, okay, we did it this way, if you guys wanna benefit from it, hey, here it is, this is the Gerber files, this is, these are the design specs, just go do that. We did that one a couple of years. We actually had over 20 contributions that way. But at the end, we saw that mm, adoptions on those things were not as much. So the next time around we did it, through OAI, OAM, was that let's just do it together. It's not that my company did it, here it is. Let's just sit together, what do we want? And this is the big system. And we had three reference design systems built around this through the community, and it seems that they are successful in building some of those. That solved the hardware aspect. You're asking about software. 
Now for the software, I have to cut it into at least two pieces, the infrastructure software and then the application software. A lot of us want the application software to just run. You have a particular GPU from a particular company, the software that runs on that um, in, in the wild needs to run on these OCP systems too. That's understood. <clears throat> it's understood and people do that. Um, uh, suppliers understand what that means. They go do that. They work with the supplier of that GPU or IPU or similar and they actually make that happen. What doesn't happen, and that's what we as kind of a community of open source people would like to bridge, is the infrastructure software. Um, people build wonderful products. Hardware-wise, it is complete. It runs the application very well, but we want to take it into data center. It doesn't work because the security uh, um, was not, it was done a different way. Management, uh, uh, remote access, those things were done in a different way. It takes nine months, sometimes 18 months to massage a large system so that it conforms with what a data center needs. Well, that's been difficult. So this year, what we're doing, tomorrow I'll talk about it a little bit more, five o'clock, what this, five o'clock as, as part of the executive talk we'll have, we will introduce this concept of an integrated system. Uh, we call it data center ready integrated system, which includes a data center ready modular hardware system on top of that, you land software ingredients. Software in that means not, not applications, but the infrastructure software. Uh, how to upgrade your, your ROM, how to, uh, how to uh, do the security, RAS, telemetry, benchmarking, how do you do those things? Because we, we, we do have um, those type of tools in-house, um, and it works for us, and it will work for the particular supplier that's building something for us and we will have tight connection with that team and we'll make it work. But to solve the earlier problem, which meant contributing to OCP but nobody can benefit from it, to solve that problem, we have understood, and we're working with a number of other companies, to um, also contribute the infrastructure software on top of it. So DC stack, data center ready stack that is integrated, hardware and software, is the method that we believe will take us there and we'll invite collaborations, um, com different companies, bring in your Linux stack, bring your Windows stack, bring in your um, telemetry, bring in your benchmarking. And we will, we will start with reference designs and based on reference designs, people check it out, do an open BMC, do an OSF, they just add on top of it. That's the basic idea. So the, regarding the infrastructure, so it is a little bit more uh, common and abstract way to approach the problem. So how, what is your opinion about the one API or Rackham or in the heterogeneous system, there is actually standard uh, uh, programming model and the library. Does it work? Th 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 those are good proposals. I don't know if it works or not. We need to... We need to come up with different proposals, compare them against each other, and see who is, in fact, um, putting energy into it. Oh. Um, the energy, doing it and keep doing it, maintaining it, make it better, and making it useful so that other people see the same benefit and want to add to it, that's the trick. Um, the, the, the days that silos were built, I know how to do it myself, and that's all I do. Uh, it's, 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 it's waning. Mm -hmm. uh, they, we recognize that people can still differentiate even if the infrastructure is the same. Um, good examples are if we have better roads, uh, my fast car runs better. Uh, somebody else might have a beautiful car. Um, okay, it does not run as fast, but it is beautiful and revered for a different reason. But let the roads be the same. Let the traffic signs be the same. Don't let us get stuck in traffic or in accidents. Yeah. <clears throat> so let the infrastructure. And now another point, um, don't know how much time we have here. Um, the whole idea at the end is for software to run flawlessly. But if we just say that, hey, 
uh, please, whoever is building this hardware, make sure it runs my software flawlessly. If we just say that, it, it won't happen. They don't know what that means. So what we've had to do was to cut it into smaller pieces, saying, okay, um, software needs hardware to run, so let's standardize on certain elements of hardware. Identify individual modules. I have a compute element, uh, universal building block, for example, for GPUs, or HPM, host processor memory module for CPU type things. So that is one element identified. And then let the secure control module be uh, separate so that um, that could be dedicated to a particular company. So that module is DC SCM. IO module, uh, let it be flexible. Mm, people might ask, uh, how many slots do you need? Well, I don't know. <laughs> do you want a GPU system? Do you want a networking centric system? Do you want a storage set centric system? Well, let that be abstracted. So when you start with HPM and bring all of your I.O. to the edge of the board with cable connected to a large module that's data center ready modular I.O., then you, you have the flexibility of building whatever system you want with the same difficult device that is HPM. The host processor module is the kind of the toughest one to debug. We want that to be constant, but the system around it will be different. Power module, some people like 12 volts, some people like 48 volts. Well, let that be a variable also, that's okay. Chassis, some chassis are deeper, some are shallow, some are 2U, some of them 2RU, some of them 2 OU, some of them are, mm -hmm. that's okay. Uh, let the, again, building blocks be done in such a way that you can put them together in different ways. De each one will provide differentiation for the suppliers. And, but if the infrastructure is the same, software, security, management, telemetry, upgrade of firmware, uh, then um, although shapes of the hardware might be different, once they're done, once they're debugged on their own and they want to present it to data center, it will go through faster. Not, not 18 months, not zero, maybe three months, maybe six months, not 18 months. Awesome. Your related question. Um, I, I like where this is going, but let's just say I, I'm an enterprise and you can relate back to your enterprise days. And I want to, enterprises don't have armies of software and firmware engineers and that sort of thing. So let's just say there's a few architects that can say, okay, I want these building blocks, put them together. There's software that you're talking about. What's next? Is there a like system integrator community. Is there someone you can call and say, I'm looking for OCP solutions, but not just OCP hardware, because you can buy that now, but really plug and play support structure around this software in a system. Right, uh, good question. The word plug and play is key. Um, I, again, as part of my journey, um, last year when we were doing DCSCM, uh, data center ready secure control module, we articulated a module that had things like BMC, root of trust, flush, flash devices and such on it. Interface, standard interface to the host processor memory module. We defined that, but we, could, we did not dare saying this is plug and play. We said it is plug and code. <laughs> which, exactly. Which, which meant that, okay, the hardware is the same, but somebody else has to come in with their, uh, with their, with their first infrastructure code yeah and um, work, work. I think the code is the problem for most enterprises. It, 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 true, so that's what I'm saying. That's what we did and did not hit, hit the mark. Now, another point, enterprise data center, edge data center, or hyperscale data center. Uh, nowadays, um, we're trying to say that um, the solutions we're presenting are not only for hyperscale data centers because Hyperscale data centers nowadays have a lot of enterprise systems in them. And once they build them, they want to put them in an edge somewhere. So it would be nice if, you, if we collectively build a set of systems that can be put into edge, different perhaps uh, shape of the chassis, but the same infrastructure. Put it in the edge or um, an enterprise system 
could have the same software infrastructure uh, so that the rest of the data center utilities can work well with it. And the high, high volume, uh, run of the mill, general purpose systems uh, could also be built using the same infrastructure. So this year, this, this week, we're introducing the concept and we ask for people to come and help build the model of hardware, different modules, and software, different modules. And while we put them together, we work it out so that suppliers can test things on their own. Uh, normally, uh, what I do uh, at this time. Do you want to throw up the presentation? No, this is, this is what I did in Amsterdam two years ago, so I'm going to do it again. Okay. So this uh, is a complete set. Somebody built it, somebody put a cap on it, and tested it. It worked. They bring it to me, and I say, I like everything about this, but I'd like this cap to be a red cap. Uh, because this is my secure control module. It has my security patches and all my firmware and such. But the fact that the entire system was built and tested on its own, I trust the rest of the system works. I changed this one to a red cap. In Amsterdam, I had uh, all, um, a mineral water that was gassed and no gas. So they're different colors. So it was easy to show that. So a different color works here, and that color might be for Meta might be for Google, Microsoft, Amazon, or somebody else. But the fact that this was, could be built, could be tested, validated on its own without interfacing any of the hyperscaler guys or any of the enterprise guys on its own, now you bring it to enterprise, and enterprise guy says, well, my customer asked for a yellow module or red module, and that's okay. That the work involved in doing that is simpler, not zero but simpler. Yep. And, and once we are successful in that, then these things will go in a catalog and goes in the marketplace for OCP. And you just say, I want such and such thing with yellow cap. I want such and such thing with blue cap. So in other words, blue cap has been built, yellow cap has been built. Now I'm asking the system integrator to go, please do that three months of effort of combining them and now present it. Okay, so that's much easier to go through the data center. So this is awesome. What is success for you tomorrow? Because you're kind of issuing this call to the community. Is it to take this work stream and merge it with you? Is it to just have some n number of participants joining and starting to lift that weight? Um, I, I'm happy to kind of say that a lot of people are um, aligned with this concept. Right. Um, they're not ready to announce who the companies mm -hmm. are yet. But what I'm hoping to do is lay out a, a, a roadmap. Yeah, a vision. Uh, this is where we are sitting. It's uh, November of 2021, Global Summit. Uh, the next thing that we get together, hopefully in Prague uh, in April, I would like to have a skeleton of a schematic uh, or, or specification, perhaps some maybe mock-ups. And a year from now, we'll have a better uh, mock-up. Yeah. The first mock-up might be based on what we've done in the past, a modular system in the past. Mm -hmm. We just say, okay, this is the hardware done at revision 1.0, but software now can be built on it. Mm -hmm. So that might be the beginning of next year. A year from now, I hope that we collectively build that reference design that is now the second version of it. It's done not by a company, but by multiple companies. And hopefully the year later is when we go to production. And that sounds like a formal OCP working group at that point. I, that, 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 that is forming a, a subgroup to, to do that work. Yeah, and that was one of your calls to action. Awesome. Okay, so yes, sir, we'll, we'll do what you like. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay, let's thank CMAC. That was thank you. wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, CMAC. Uh, I'm interested to hear from AWS. <laughs> How can this community benefit you? you? You have a very interesting problem on your hand that's very aligned, I feel. Thanks. I'm trying to guess where the, where the workloads and where the users and where the value is going to be and trying to design to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, so 
I've been working on this MLNA platform uh, from system design from block diagram to having it in the data center and seeing it, uh, there are problems in there and how we repair it, et cetera. So from the OCP community, what uh, I would uh, also want to hear is that um, we want to also talk about debuggability mm. of a problem, right? Um, so we talked about a lot of, uh, so he said, uh, day zero inventions and awesome, right? That's good. Um, but we said, this is, this is what we found. This is great. Now start using it. And then, but the problem is yours, right? So, and we, we all start moving, but there are a lot of breadcrumbs behind. And uh, so it'll be better for us to think about uh, what's happening on the floor. I know it's a little detailed, but I think if people can come together once a year or six months and see what are the problems we faced and how we can resolve this by using this IO versus this SSD versus this one, you standardize things out. I don't know if you're allowed to talk at all about how you get to workload understanding because you, you're a consumer right. service, essentially. What I find is we're all using the same computer vision libraries at Stanford. We're all using the same prediction algorithms. So this is so much library call focused at the core of these algorithms that gives us a starting point to design as a community. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, certainly, again, um, as a hardware design engineer, um, um, as I was saying to another person that uh, uh, I want to start architecting based on what my customer wants, right? What kind of uh, algorithm I'm going to run or a particular customer is going to run. Um, and then what is my, how is my architecture going to look in model towards his uh, requirement? Um, and and uh, how I can tweak it, should I have a better memory or more SSDs versus more GPUs with HBM? Um, those are the trade-offs that I'm looking for. Um, and the earlier we plan towards it, um, the easier that we can achieve it, or we don't have to change the course in the middle of a project based on our understanding later. Um, also, if, so if we know things earlier, then it would be better for us to design things sooner. So regarding the, the deep debugging issue you mentioned, so uh, depending on what you play with, the level of debugging mm -hmm. capability is quite different. So for example, if you have a PCI issue, you have to plug in the PCI analyzer. SSD case, if you have a problem, you have to connect T32 and see what's going on there. Right, right. right? So for example, the the systems that use uh, PCIe with three timers in the market and stuff like that. What are the top 10 problems we have seen when, from the firmware perspective or the hardware perspective? And passing that to the community that probably will be helpful for others to pick up on it and uh, know, hey, vendor A, vendor B, vendor C, or, or they are all together. Everybody comes and says to us, hey, we are OCP compliant, or we are PCIe compliant. Everybody brings a, brings a bag of problems. And that's what we have found on the ground. So, so it'll be easier for everyone to pick up that someone left off or from, learn from others' problems. And we also talk about other problems as well. I think that will benefit everybody. So regarding that, do you think uh, hardware or component need to provide a more generic way to debug? Yeah, I mean, instead of using the expensive the analyzer or the debugging tools. True, that, right. Uh, so like two years before, three years before, when we started with PLX and other switch and uh, vendors, we, said, we, we found out in data center we cannot use a PC analyzer because, of course, security, et cetera. Right? We cannot roll PC analyzer inside. So we, we requested PLX and people, if there is a way to um, get the last 10 transactions of a failure and trigger it on a protocol analyzer like inbuilt. So they're coming up with a new device in there. So um, with, with inbuilt protocol analyzer in there when needed. So those are the things that uh, we can uh, learn from each other and uh, at least move the vendors towards the right direction from our experience. Yeah. Interesting. So CMX, so how do you handle this issue in your, in your platform? 
the the prototype. I think Matt had a question. Uh, prototyping. Um, <laughs> Give, give me a hint. I probably missed the context. Yeah, so the, the, so the, he mentioned about <laughs> debugging problem. And depending on what device you are play with, you may need a uh, very low level debugger like uh, the PCI analyzer or T32 kind of thing. But in, in the data center, that kind of option is not actually option. <laughs> so the. Uh, the, let me, I ask a question about whether the hardware component needs some sort of the debuggability by itself, not using the kind of low-level tools. Right. And uh, if you apply that kind of concept to the your the the, the modular, modular right. the prototype, right. they, there should be something to support right. that. So, so um, as as part of the definition of this modular hardware system, um, we, we we first started. With, um, with a motherboard that everybody builds. On the motherboard, you have processor and DIMM slots and I.O. slots. You normally have a BMC flash device and all that. We said, okay, so the one that is common for um, processor suppliers is the mem memory slot and processor socket and I.O. slot. Take this out. What's left is the heart of the motherboard that the collection of secret sauce sometimes, management, security, those type of things. We took that one out, that, that became the heart of the motherboard. That's the DCSCM, that's a data center ready um, secure control module. Some of the attributes that we, 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 we wrote down, articulated from the beginning as goal of that project was remote debug. So we said, this is a device that is connected to the data center. That is the entry to the chassis, entry to the world of a CPU complex. But it is dedicated, it, it has an interface that's dedicated to a particular data center. Data center could be enterprise data center or hyperscale data center. And one of the major uh, needs of that data center is remote debug. There are trade-offs between debuggability and security and there are different time frames that you would enable certain features um, during a prototype and development phase versus production phase um, that the data center needs to decide to enable features at what time. Um, sometimes even a, a USB um, port is not allowed. Sometimes a VGA connector for uh, diagnosing locally is not allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, remote is important. Now, by the time we go to production, hopefully you have solved all the problems so you don't need to uh, debug it locally anymore. But um, redirecting console, uh, doing things that people do on the uh, in-band uh, are the ones that you will have if you don't allow physical uh, uh, access if you don't allow even uh, remote debug because certain features because of security needs to be turned off. So those are those are the trade-offs. Uh, well, you didn't mention the complexity of going from host to nodes and the interconnected nature of the scalability of those things. It's right. Access, really crazy. Access amount of data that you need to move. Uh, if it is a crash, crash dump on multiple systems, uh, how do you extract all of the yeah. data? how much bandwidth you need to do all of that. Uh, so those are tough, and it's good to know how, how you guys solve this. Thank you. I think Matt had a question. Yeah, uh, since you had last at the mic, uh, we, you brought up an example of PCI and, and debugging, and you can't debug that in the data center. You know, point-to-point -point CXL will be kind of the same. I lose sleep over these complex CXL diagrams <laughs> with switches in multiple stages. At that point, it's, it's approaching the complexity of an of a Ethernet network. How does that get debugged? Is CXL thinking about the debuggability at, in the design? Even something as simple as a capture and span or any, any of those sort of aspects, once you have a network? Uh, okay, so CXL specification is not touching it. It's not part of the scope of the CXL specification, that debug. But individual companies who are building those things are very worried about it. 
and very similar to the problem that we've had to solve with PCIe switches. You're very familiar with um, pre-emphasis and post-emphasis and yep. different taps, locations, and they um, basically um, logic analyzer capability that are provided inside the, those buffers. Those things will still be necessary. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and that's one point. It's the point from providing the solution. From the other side of it, avoiding the problems. If it hurts, don't do it kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. Put things where they belong. Mm -hmm. um, uh, local disaggregation, the concept of disaggregate, but in a small scope that you can afford it. If fault tolerant is too big, uh, if you're going to a rack level or a data center level of fabric, oh man, that's a tough problem. If it is too tough, create a small enough an environment that you can handle it so that you, the blast radius of a particular problem is uh, controlled. And another very important point is CXL is a new technology. Uh, I, for one, don't want it to be uh, tarnished with a lot of problems that are not necessary first time. So the first time, let it be simple, kind of sweet, one device at a time. We just figured out what it is. Collectively, we learned what else we need to do, and we just build a larger and larger and larger system. So this is going to be very similar to what we collectively did 200 years ago, or maybe even more, going from east to west. Gold Rush, um, that's a Santa Fe Trail. <laughs> you just go over there, and then there are different peaks to conquer and different valleys to go through. We don't know what happens after that bend. We don't know, but we have the kind of tenacity to go through it and eventually do it. And a lot of people got killed. and. Uh, but eventually, people got there, and we had California. I, I generally agree with you, um, and I, I like that CXL is starting small. What would be nice is if we, you know, I, I think PCI Express switching is kind of the Wild West, and you said, oh, it's up to the vendor. They add whatever features they are to make it work and debug it. It might be useful for... So to drive some base feature set for debuggability in these very, Excel very good, fabric very devices. Very good point. We, we should do that. The, the, the concept of PCI switching not being as part of PCI standard for multi-switch multi, multi uh, capability and fabric capability. Individual companies did that, and they were successful in products they built, but the specification did not have it uh, standardized. So at least that part of it we're doing within CXL Consortium. We, we are identifying the need and the fact that people have done it. Now we're standardizing at least on definition of single switch layers or multiple switch layers and multiple devices. That piece we are doing. Now, uh, management of it, CXL Fabric Manager, for example, is a key point. Okay. Um, and debuggability is another point. These will be the pieces that will be added. Mm -hmm. uh, the compliance suite is complete, um, just making sure things well and have a checklist of what works and what not. So that piece is doing. All in all, there's a lot of work to be done. And there's a, a, a team of volunteers coming in. We just have to look from the top and rank it and see what needs to be done today, what needs to be done next year, is it part of 2.0 specification or 3.0 specification? So yeah, I keep saying, please come and help. Um, ask questions, challenge, and then help uh, come up with proposals and uh, help uh, refine the proposals. Thanks. Did you have a question for I, I think that was just that just general area of debuggability of PCI-like things. I think we covered it pretty well. It, 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 it is very tough. It just it is very tough. I mean, uh, it, it was not only uh, hardware problems, right, in the electrical level with the pre-emphasis or post-emphasis. It was also like a software addressing causing problems, whereas the completion time would because of that, and the entire CPU crashes taking the GPU along with it. Um, so, so debuggability is one thing where we want to shorten our cycle. Um, the other one towards that could be that if we can also define validation that is required, 
like we have we have kind of prescribing the hardware we are prescribing the software now how are we going to validate it that's another um uh, that's another container right so the more from from a device or let, let's say we say it's a ocp compliant or our hardware is ocp okay. compliant or firmware is ocp compliant like plug and play that whatever we are thinking where we want to be we also want to standardize validation so that uh, it because what we find is that what works for 100 systems doesn't work for 10000 systems that's and i and and so that's another thing it will be very interesting to see if we all put to the minds together and see how we can validate and make a robust platform rather than okay this is my hardware firmware please go do it right so, um, just again to 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 to, to extend the uh, invitation to come and <laughs> come and participate <laughs> um, is that first uh, identifying the problems right. really and then articulating that um, getting people to start helping that's that by itself is very valuable the next step is of course um, every, every time that you solve a problem it's good to bring it to the uh, consortium and describe it joining a consortium is a good thing to do so um, um, yeah, I extend that uh, invitation I don't know if anyone will answer this, but I'll just throw it out there. There's a lot of debate in these large distributed AI systems. Should we interconnect them with plain old ether? You know, I showed the front end back end network in that diagram. Should that exist or should it be one network? Should we try to build like rack scale CXL type clusters or like you said, keep the failure domain small, connect everything with ethernet? It was a good question in the talk over there. It's like Ethernet has had this long life. CXL might give it a run for the money. You know what? Well, uh, who's the horse in the race? The 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 old adage: um, all of these problems will be solved, and once it is solved, it will be called Ethernet. I think that's a. <laughs> <laughs> Per, per, paraphrasing, <laughs> phrasing, what, what, what that was. But the, the point is, um, once it gets mainstream, um, we want it to be the same everywhere. Now call it Ethernet or similar. But until then, um, we want uh, different things to be tested. Um, we should allow that, hey, the back end network is different from the front end network. And, if somebody wants to get in there and do it quickly and demonstrate a particular value, either for fault tolerance, latency, bandwidth, or a particular protocol that's important, we should allow that. So yes, at the beginning, in any architecture, we have to allow the distinction of front-end network and back-end network. Work through that, see what are the values that people need. Could the one that is actually mainstream solve that problem or not? If, if not, this generation, ask them why not? Why why can't why can these guys do and you can't? And they've done a good job. And yeah, RDMA was perceived. InfiniBand came and did it, and they said, hey, oh, me too. We can do Rocky. Okay, so now we have Rocky and it's kind of good enough. Yeah. So um, and then if you say it is not good enough, yeah, and we link guys want to do it that way. Open Capi guys want to do it that way. CXL guys are saying, yeah, we, we can perhaps do it also. Now, we want to do more. What are the main characteristics of import? Latency, robustness, uh, bandwidth, uh, fault tolerance, all of those things. If one technology cannot do it, the community of users need it. It gets done. Second generation, third generation, it might get consolidated. That's, I think, the history of what we've done, right? Um, and, even, long game. and eventually call it Ethernet. <laughs> Thank you, Sivak. Okay, um, so this session was due to wrap up at four. Happy to keep having the conversation. Yes, I'm getting signal from the back. 
we've got time, but um, the schedule did say four, so uh, I want to honor that and honor honor you all of your time. We're happy to keep going. Like uh, I'm sticking around for at least another half hour or so, and then um, yeah, if you would like to go, this is your invitation that you, you can get about your day, and we'll see you at the rest of summit. Okay. Anybody else have any questions or things while we have some folks still lingering around that you're interested in chatting about or, or learning about? We didn't really get to the liquid cooling, but there's going to be plenty of discussion around that and, and immersive cooling uh, for the rest of Summit. Um, so come and find me if you want to chat some about that. We're doing a lot of development there. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, uh, gentlemen, for, for sharing what's on your mind. That's very, very fascinating for us to learn that. Thank you.